Welcome to this God-inspired message from Shofar Christian Church. Enjoy today's message. May you experience the presence of our Father and may you grow deeper in your relationship with Him. Amen. What a special moment. Just to be able to celebrate all of these kids. Jesus loves kids. And such a joy that we get to just join with them in their celebration, in their dedication, in their just committing children to the grace of God as we pray for them this morning. That's what we do. We say, God, these are your kids. They're gifts from your hand. And we just want to entrust them to you. We want to pray your blessing and your favor upon them, that you would lead, that you would guide them. Jesus, we trust for their day of salvation when they themselves would come to the moment of calling on the name of Jesus and grow in relationship with Jesus all the days of their lives. And we acknowledge God as the provider of these beautiful kids. And He really does provide. We're just so thankful if you look around. We're a, a fruitful church by God's grace. Not only these kids, but there are a whole bunch of little tummies growing all over the place. And it's not because the ladies eat too much. Um, it's beautiful blessings growing in, in all of their tummies. And it's just so exciting to see what God is doing and continue to do. Obviously, this morning, we've already been long, so I don't want, we're not going to spend too much time or around the message, but I, I do believe God wants to share and speak into some of our hearts and some of our lives this morning. I, one of my, my big failures, if that's the word in life, regret in life, is I've never learned and maybe I'm just not good at languages on the one hand, and maybe I'm just not disciplined enough. But I've never learned one of our, our local languages. Obviously, Afrikaans is a local language, which I know and which speak. But I, I haven't learned any of the, the other. I know two of our 11 languages, so it's almost 30%, which one needs to pass nowadays. But, but I do remember at primary school, we learned a little bit of Zulu. And learned, picked up a couple of words here and there over the years. And there's one word that always struck me. And I really believe is, is such a beautiful principle. How many of us ever learned any Zulu at school some way? Who can remember any Zulu that we learned? Okay, definitely not me. Apart from one or two few words. I remember one, I don't know, it just stuck with me always. Apparently we were told this is really good Zulu in primary school. I've tried it since, and everyone just looks at me with these big eyes, like, what on earth are you saying? Something along the kinds of the lines, and just obviously accent is absolutely useless, but something along the lines of, it's meant to say it takes the fish out of the water, and everyone just says, what does that mean? We were told it means it's very hot. Okay. Apparently, it doesn't. I've tried saying it once or twice among Zulu people, and they just say, Philip, just don't say that again. But there was another word, saubona. I think most of us have heard that somewhere along the line. And we've seen that. Maybe said it ourselves. And it's a word which inherently actually has so much power. For those who are unfamiliar, even more than me, with the Zulu language, it's the typical greeting in Zulu. When you see someone, you would greet them and you would say saubona. And while it's sort of become accepted, like it's a way of saying hello or hi, inherently it means I see. I see you. And I think that's such a beautiful way in which we greet people. I think it's something which captures a little bit of the heart of God and the life of Jesus. We read in the book of Genesis, there's a, a lady, her name is Hagar, she becomes the mother of Ishmael, and at one stage she's going through some stuff, and she has this moment, and she realizes that God sees her. And in that moment, one of God's names, Jehovah al Roy, is, bro is, bro is born, the God who sees. And so this morning, I want, and it's just for a few moments that we have together, just to think a little bit about this God who sees. In John chapter 1, Jesus has just started his ministry, he's just beginning to travel, and not even travel so much, but he's walking around the lake, and he sees Peter and John and James and 
Peter and Andrew and James and John and some others, and he starts calling his first disciples to himself. And so Jesus decided to go to Galilee, and he found Philip, obviously the best of all of the disciples, and said to him, come, follow me. Philip was from Bethsaida, Andrew and Peter's hometown. Philip went to look for Nathanael and told him, we have found the very person Moses and the prophets wrote about. His name is Jesus, the son of Joseph from Nazareth. Nazareth, exclaimed Nathanael. Can anything good come from Nazareth? Come and see for yourself, Philip replied. I remember a couple of years ago when I also spoke on a little bit from this passage, I made a comment which apparently didn't go down so well. I used a town not too far away from here, starting with a B. <laughs> I said, maybe it's a equivalent, you know, can anything come, good comes from Boxburg or Benoni or whatever. I can't even remember which one it was. And obviously, facetious, just tongue-in-cheek, a joke, really good things. Anybody here come from Boxburg or Benoni? Huh? <laughs> See, good things do come from there. And I made the joke back then, and a young lady to the student service, couple of hundred students there, comes up to me afterwards and very offended, genuinely upset that I could say something bad about our hometown. So I won't say anything about maybe kind of like Brackenfell or something because hopefully not too many Brackenfell. Anyway, can anything good come from this place which people around look down on because this is where Jesus is from? Jesus wasn't born amongst the high and the mighty. He wasn't born in a palace. He wasn't born into nobility. He wasn't born into a family of influence. He was born into a town where everyone looks at and says, can anything good come from this place? He didn't have, in human terms, stature and unseen, so and so said in Afrikaans. He didn't, wasn't somebody who kind of people looked up to because of his status in life. He was born in a, a very average, very normal, ordinary household. And so he starts calling these people, and Philip realizes there's something special about this Jesus. He goes and calls his friend Nathaniel, and Nathaniel is a little bit tongue-in-cheek, maybe a little bit more. He's like, wait, from Nazareth, seriously? Are you trying to joke with me? Nothing good comes from Nazareth. Philip says, come and see. Just come and experience something of this Jesus guy. As they approached Jesus, or as they approached, Jesus said, now here is a genuine son of Israel, a man of in complete integrity. How do you know about me? Nathaniel, or Nathaniel asked. Jesus replied, I could see you under the fig tree before Philip found you. Some of the more literal translations, it, it says very clearly, before Philip called you, I saw you. So we're talking today about a God who sees I could see you under the fig tree before Philip found you. Then Nathanael exclaimed, Rabbi, you are the Son of God, the King of Israel. Jesus asked him, do you believe this? Just because I told you I had seen you under the fig tree, you will see greater things than this. Then he said, I tell you the truth, you will all see heaven open and the angels of God going up and down on the Son of Man, the one who is the stairway between heaven and earth. And so in this moment, Jesus is inviting Nathaniel and Philip and the others who are with him in this conversation. He's saying there is something pretty crazy about to happen. But it starts with seeing. And what I love is such a beautiful play on words here. As so as soon as Philip comes and he fetches Nathaniel, Nathaniel Here's this word from Jesus. You see, Jesus sees something of Nathaniel. He doesn't see Nathaniel's body. He doesn't see Nathaniel's stature. He sees right into the depth of Nathaniel. And he says, Nathaniel, I recognize that you are a man of integrity. Nathaniel's response to that is, you truly God. You know something. Maybe there was something that happened in Nathaniel's life just the day or two before. We know what integrity is. You see, integrity isn't doing what is right when everybody is watching. I think integrity is something much needed in South Africa. Election time is coming up. Integrity is needed. 
Just by the way, next week I'm going to be speaking a little bit about the elections and how can we make informed decisions when it comes to casting our ballot. See, integrity isn't doing what is right when nobody is watching, when everybody is watching. Integrity is doing what is right when nobody is watching. It's not about not taking the 10 rand or the 100 rand or the 1,000 rand when I know I'm going to be caught. It's not doing it when I know I won't be caught. When I know nobody will ever know. So we don't know, maybe, just in the few days before this, Nathaniel was in one of those situations where he could have. Maybe he was signing off on a tender. There was a, a business transaction taking place. There was a moment that he was involved in, and he knew, right now, I can do really, really well for myself, and nobody else will ever know, except I'll know. I'm going to do what is right. I'm going to choose to do what is honest and what is just. And out of a, a situation like that or a lifestyle like that, he walks in and Jesus looks at him and says, I recognize there's something inside of you, Nathaniel. Nathaniel's response is to open towards God and to say, you really are, you know something that other people don't know. Because once again, integrity isn't what happens in the light, it's what happens in the darkness. And Jesus, you've looked right into this darkness and you've seen my behavior, which no one else could see. And then we start seeing this play on words, starting with Jesus seeing Nathaniel. See, our journey with Jesus doesn't start with us seeing anything. It starts with Jesus seeing us. We'll touch on that in just a moment. But then he invites us to come and see. Maybe even before that, Philip invited Nathaniel and said, come and see. And it's not so much, we should realize this, when we invite people to Jesus, it's the refrain that we see over and over, these words, come and see. There's a beautiful example, our Convergence Conference later this year, it's sort of grounded in the scripture of a woman who is at the well, she comes to a well, she is an outcast of society, she's getting water for herself, and she has an encounter with Jesus by himself there. He sends his disciples away, so it's just him and this woman, and this woman realizes that just Je this Jesus is more than a normal man. She runs back to her town where she's an outcast, and she runs with this invitation, come and see a man. Come and see. But as much as we go and we invite people to come and see, we're actually inviting them to come and be seen. See, before we see Jesus, He sees us. I so love these babies as we pray for them because a part of the truth is that before Jesus formed them in their mother's womb, He knew them and He'd seen them. He's watched over them all the days of their life and He, he cares for them. But as much as there is Jesus who is watching us, who is looking at us, who is looking out for us, when we in a way begin to step near to Him because He is drawing us near to Him, we allow Him to see us differently and we allow Him to show us that we are seen. See, it's not so much that Nathaniel was only seen for the first time in this moment. He only realized he was seen in this moment. I wonder how many other people Jesus saw in his time on earth. But it's only when we draw near to him that we realize that Jesus is the God who sees. He's been seeing me. And so it starts with an invitation, come and see, which it actually means come and be seen. And as he steps in to a relationship with Jesus, it starts with Jesus saying, I've seen you. And then he says, I don't want to spend too much time on this, but there's something so beautiful in this principle. He says, I've seen you all along. Do you believe this just because I told you that I had seen you? You will see greater things than this. Tell you the truth, you will see. And he carries on about things we will see. So as we're invited to come and see, we step into a relationship with Jesus and we realize we've been seen. God has been seeing us. And right now, he sees us. And not only does He see us, He invites us to come alongside Him and to see. To begin to see what the world doesn't see. To begin to see differently. To begin to see great things. It's an invitation to walk alongside Jesus and with Jesus. 
And as we do that, we see Jesus doing amazing things. I count that as one of my greatest privileges in life is that God has allowed me to step into ministry, not because I get to stand up here and I get to speak and I get to do a bunch of other things, but because I get to see. I get to see God turning lives upside down. I get to see people who are far from Jesus draw near to Him. I get to see broken people made whole. I get to see couples go through disappointment, perhaps of childbirth and the hurt and the pain, but holding on to Jesus, and Jesus comes and redeems. And another child is on the way. I get to see couples. I, I couldn't know, I'm sure they won't mind saying this. Trusting God to adopt, and the process becomes a little bit extended, but they hold on to faith, and Jesus comes through, and little Yanu comes as a gift from God into their life. We get to see that. We get to see Jesus healing and restoring, making whole and redeeming. And so we walk with Jesus. He invites us into an invitation to see, to see beauty and wholeness. We see another example of Jesus seeing in, in Luke chapter 19. Jesus enters Jericho, different town far away from Jerusalem, and he's walking through Jericho. He's making his way through the town, walking through the streets, and there was a man there named Zacchaeus. He was the chief tax collector in the region. Now, we didn't have time to sort of get into all of what that meant, but what that basically means is a couple of things. Number one, he was probably wealthy because he was probably a little bit dishonest and skimming something off the top. He was also probably wealthy because it was a wealthy profession. There was a lot of margin that was rightfully due to him. It also meant he was probably an unpopular man amongst his people. Because he wasn't just a lake. It's not like, I guess, if you work for SARS, in South Africa, if you're working for SARS, please don't put up your hand. Um, if you work for SARS, maybe everyone is going to kind of sometimes around the bry and make a little bit of a joke or two around you. And, but it's an accepted profession. But here the difference isn't that you're just working for the tax agency. You're working for an oppressive foreign tax agency. You're working for a people who are oppressing us and taking our money, taking our funds for their people. For them. They're not using, as the tax is meant to be, funds to grow and develop our people. They're taking our, what our taxes and what we're bringing to enrich themselves, a different people, the Romans in this context. And he's the chief tax collector, so he's collecting from his people to give to the Romans. They were not popular amongst their brethren. And so here's this man. He's a chief tax collector in the region, and he had become very rich. He tried to get a look at Jesus, but he was too short to see over the crowd. As Matati left, uh, she can demonstrate this for us. You see, he tried to see Jesus, but he couldn't see Jesus. In his case, it was because he was short. It was his physical stature. And there were other people in the way. Fortunately, it's not a problem I have to deal with often in my life. But, you know, sometimes you go to a rugby match or you go to a concert or you go to a crowd and there's some tall person sitting in front of you. And that's normally me or someone like me. And I apologize. And you're sitting behind them and you can't see. And so sometimes there's obstacles and there's reasons in our lives why we can't see Jesus. For Zacchaeus, it was a matter of physical height. He couldn't see Jesus. For some of us, it may be hurt or pain. For some of us, it may be brokenness. For some of us, it may be the idea that was painted to us about who Jesus is when we were a kid. It may have been trauma we've gone through. It may be heartbreak. There's some reasons, there's something that prevents us from seeing. We really want to, if we're totally honest with ourselves, deep on the inside, I want to see Jesus. Maybe even just out of curiosity. I think Zacchaeus wasn't much more than curious in this moment. We would love to see a glimpse of Jesus. A part of us in the midst of our hurt and our brokenness and the reasons why we can't see him, a part of us says, but I'm curious. I'd love to be able to see him. He tried to get a look at Jesus, but he was too short 
to see over the crowd. So he ran ahead and climbed a sycamore fig beside the road, for Jesus was going to pass that way. So he makes a bit of a plan. He realizes, I'm short. I can't see anyone. I'm going to miss out on the show that's happening. I was watching the, some of the cycling just for a few moments yesterday. There's a big cycling tour happening in Italy at the moment. And the guys cycle, and there are thousands of people on the side of the roads. And later on in the year, when it becomes the Tour de France, those people stand 10, 15 deep on the side of the road. And they stand there the whole day, sometimes in areas quite far away from the towns. And I don't know if you've seen cyclists cycle past. It's not a 90-minute match. It's like, here they come, there they go. Maybe this was a little bit what Zacchaeus was thinking. I'm going to sit in this tree, and Jesus, I've heard so much about him. He's going to walk past. I'm going to see him coming. I'm going to see him walk past. It's going to take 39 seconds out of my day, and then I'm going to keep making myself rich. I'm going to sort of carry on with the business of the day. So when Jesus came by, he looked up at Zacchaeus and called him by name. He saw him. He said, Zacchaeus, come down. I must be a guest in your home today. Zacchaeus quickly climbed down and took Jesus to his house in great, his house in great excitement and joy. But the people were displeased. He has gone to be the guest, I love this description, of a notorious sinner. Now Jesus should have gone and been with the Pharisees. He should have been with the holy people. He should have been with the people who were righteous. He should have been with the Nathaniels. You know, Nathaniel is the Israelite in whom there is perfect integrity. In Jericho, Jesus finds Zacchaeus sitting in a tree, the sinful man. Meanwhile, Zacchaeus stood before the Lord and said, I will give half my wealth to the poor. And if I've cheated people on their taxes, I will give them back four times as much. Something powerful happens when Jesus sees us. And I want to just kind of rephrase that because it's a little bit of a, it's a nice way I'm saying it, but it's clumsy theologically. It's not when he sees us, it's when we realize he sees us. When his eyes are looking across and we kind of find ourselves in a moment and maybe we are on the Nathaniel side and maybe we're on the Zacchaeus side. Maybe we're on the side where internally we think we're doing pretty well. And maybe we're on the other side where we know I'm a notorious sinner. I've messed up, and it's not like I messed up once. I continue to mess up. I'm living in messing up. What I love about these two stories, and in both of them, Jesus sees the person. Jesus doesn't see the sin. He's not intimidated by the brokenness and by the hurt, by the notoriety or the integrity. None of that puts him off. He sees the person deep on the inside. In a very simple way this morning, I really sense God wants to say to you this morning, He sees you. I don't know where you are and what you're going through. I don't know what your struggle was yesterday or your challenge tomorrow. The victory moment that you just wished you had someone to celebrate with. What you're wrestling with in your life, good or bad. What I do know is Jesus sees you. Maybe you're under a tree. Maybe you're on top of a tree. Maybe a tree is a good place. Jesus sees people around trees, be out in nature. Nathaniel under the tree and Zacchaeus in the tree. Jesus sees you. But he doesn't see what the world sees. He, he looks differently. And way back in the Old Testament, we see this account found in the book of 1 Samuel, chapter 16. There's this guy. He has a bunch of kids. His name's Jesse. I forget how many sons was it? Six or seven sons. He's got a bunch of sons. And the prophet arrives one day and says, one of your sons God is choosing for a special work to be the next king of Israel. Bring all of your sons. And so Jesse goes and he, he brings all of his sons and he lines them up. The first one that he looks at is the eldest son. Jesse's all proud, my eldest boy, he's the guy. You know, I sent him to the best schools. Got the best marks, 
first team rugby captain and head boy, Ducks scholar. And he has everything going. He is the one kind of everyone just looks up to him. He's a leader. He's a born leader. Here is the guy. And he puts him in front of the prophet. And the prophet looks at him and says, don't judge by his appearance or his height. For I have rejected him. The Lord doesn't see things the way you see them. People judge by outward appearance. But the Lord looks at the heart. Just to wrap up the story for those who are not familiar with it. Eventually he goes through all of the sons and he's like, it's none of these. Don't you have another son? And the dad's like, well, maybe you saw it again. Maybe it was the first boy. You were just a little bit nervous, Samuel, when this whole thing started. You know, it's actually that one. Then you have another, oh, there's another guy, but he's out by the trees. <laughs> he's out looking after the sheep. Can't be him. He's the youngest guy. He's a redhead. Who wants a redhead? You know? Call the redhead. So they call the redhead. I love redheads. My daughter's a redhead. <laughs> Bring the redhead. You know, they bring in the ginger and kind of, Daniel, Samuel looks at him and says, this is the one. The one who nobody else looked at, who nobody else bothered about. The one who the dad forgot. that. I mean, just think about the rejection quickly. The prophet comes to your house. The whole family is invited, except you. The whole family is at the party, but you're not. Except in God's eyes, you are. Eventually, he calls him, and everyone is like, David, like, let's just bring David, just so the prophet can see it's not David. And as David walks in, God is like, that's the one that I want. See, God looks at our heart, and for some of us, that's really exciting, because maybe we can associate a little bit with Nathaniel. We know we're not perfect. We know there's stuff we get wrong, but inside, we believe we're pretty dis decent people. Maybe we're like Zacchaeus. We know inside we're everything but decent people. And so we're intimidated that God looks at our heart. See, God sees your heart. He sees the beauty in your heart and he sees the brokenness in your heart. He sees the hurt and he sees the pain. He sees the disappointment. He sees the hope and he sees the joy. Nobody else sees into your heart better than Jesus sees into your heart. I'm going to ask the ushers to pass the elements of the communion around. In just a few moments, we are going to have communion. But as they, they're passing that around, in 2 Chronicles chapter 16, I've got a whole bunch of favorite verses in the Scripture, and this is right up there with him. It's really hard to pick a favorite verse, but, but this at least is in the finalists. You know, this is in the top few. For the eyes of the Lord run to and fro throughout the whole earth to show himself strong on behalf of those whose heart is loyal to him. Isn't that a beautiful thought? The eyes of the Lord go to and fro throughout the whole earth Right now, right here today, the eyes of the Lord are going to and fro throughout the whole earth. When I read this verse, I, I see a little bit of, you guys know in the movies, when the people open up their phones or their screens, and there's some device with a tracking machine in somewhere, and on the screen is this bing, bing, this little dot that's blinking. A part of me sees a little bit that God is looking for a heart's that are loyal to him. They're like these little screens, these blips on his screen that are blinking, attracting him, drawing his attention to this isn't a normal person. There's something different about this person. There's someone whose heart is loyal to God. The eyes of the Lord are going to and fro throughout the whole earth and he, he sees these little blinking hearts and I can almost imagine him sitting up in heaven saying, what can I do for them? Today, Please don't misunderstand me. I'm not for one moment saying that God's purpose is here to serve you and me, to be at our beck and call, but I do believe something in his heart is there to serve you and me. In the same way that sometimes I walk past my kids' rooms when they're asleep or whatever, and I'm thinking, what can I do for them tomorrow? What can I do that will 
make their day, their week, their month just a little bit more special. I believe that's what's in God's heart towards you and me as well. And that's what we see here. He's looking for people whose hearts are loyal to Him because He wants to show Himself strong on your behalf. See, not only does He see your hurt and your brokenness, He sees your troubles too. He sees the challenges you face. I believe right now He's in a sense standing at the ready to show Himself strong on your behalf. And the key to us entering into this place of experiencing God's hand on our behalf is in the communion in which we are to partake. I don't know you, some of you. I know well some of you. I don't know at all. I don't know where your heart is. I don't know where your loyalty is towards God, but I know me. And I know as much as I endeavor to have my heart loyal to God, my heart isn't always loyal to God. A couple of weeks ago, I was flying um, to Cape Town or, or back from Cape Town or whatever. As I got on the plane, I took out the boarding pass, and in my wallet, I happened to have the wrong boarding pass. I had the right one as well, but I, I took out the wrong one from the wrong airline. I said, oops, wrong one, took out the right one. Thanks, Shingi. And the air hostess said, oh, you should be a little bit more loyal, <laughs> sort of jokingly because of the different airline. And I said, I am. I'm loyal to my wallet. She had a good laugh and she said, well, that's a good answer, you know. But the reality is sometimes there are other things I find my heart loyal to and not only Jesus. Obviously, in that context, we can be loyal to Jesus and my wallet. It's not an exclusive one. But there are times when Jesus speaks and where he calls and I find I'm, or maybe I'm, here's a scary one, I'm a little bit more loyal to my family right now than I am to Jesus. Can I just set our hearts at rest? I don't believe Jesus, let me phrase it differently, I believe Jesus in every decision, in everything he calls me to, is not only to my benefit too, but to my family's benefit too. But it doesn't look that way at the start. And so when I'm saying God is calling us to be loyal, I'm not thinking he's calling us to be disloyal to our families. Thanks, Shingi. But I do believe sometimes he's calling us just to take a step back and say, would I serve Jesus first? Would I place him first? And sometimes, if I'm totally honest, that's a hard one for me to answer. I find myself, I'm not primarily loyal to Jesus. Maybe I even find myself times being really primarily loyal to my wallet and not to Jesus. Maybe I sense Jesus is stirring me to act in a certain way and the rants and sense gets in the way. Sometimes I'm loyal to my comfort or I'm loyal to my off time. I'm loyal to whatever it may be that's not Jesus. And it's in that moment that the beauty of the cross becomes true. That Jesus can walk up to a notorious sinner. Maybe you don't consider yourself quite a notorious sinner. You're just a sinner. You're not a notorious sinner, yeah? Whether we're Zacchaeus or whether we're Nathaniel, Jesus can walk in and he says, I can make you pure and righteous and holy. And I can stand before Jesus with a heart loyal to him, not loyal to him because I'm so great or I'm so special or I get this right, but because he does something in my heart and he turns my heart to him. And in the times when my heart is not loyal, I'm not talking about deliberate sin. I'm not talking about being deliberately disobedient and disobeying God and walking in a different direction. There's times in the wrestling, the times when, Jesus, I genuinely want to follow you, but I don't know how, or I just fail because I'm a human and the spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. In those moments, the cross of Jesus speaks so loudly. And I realize that Jesus sees but when he looks at me, it's not just that he sees my sin and he sees my failure. He sees the cross where he died. And he sees me through the cross. And he sees me as holy and as righteous and as pure. And he sees me as having a heart loyal to him. Because the cross has made my heart loyal to him. The cross has made my hands clean and my heart pure. The cross makes me someone like Nathaniel where I can stand. Maybe I was a notorious sinner, but the blood of Jesus has washed me. And now I stand like Nathaniel as a man in whom there is no deceit, 
some translations say, a man of pure integrity. And so I don't know where you are this morning. I don't know what your relationship with Jesus looks like, but I do want to invite you. I want to invite you to come and see. Come and be seen. Come and be in a place where you realize that Jesus has and continues to see you. He sees you. I just sense this morning, God wants to write those words on your spirit. God sees you. And He doesn't see you the way the world sees you. He doesn't see you through a questionnaire of right and wrong and a score sheet. He doesn't see you through the KPIs, the key performance indicators. He doesn't see you as the boss sees you. He looks right to the depth of your heart and sees you for how He made you, for how He shaped you and formed you. And He sees everything that He's put inside of you because He built you and He created you. Just like these beautiful kids earlier this morning, Jesus built and created and shaped them. He knew them before he put them into their mother's womb. He knows you. And so he holds an invitation out to come and be seen by the God who sees. Allow him to turn your heart and to show you what loyalty to Jesus looks like. Because he wants to show himself strong on your behalf. Can we stand this morning? I'd love for us to pray together. Jesus, this morning we are just astounded at the power of grace, Lord. Lord, I I know as I stand here and you look at me, there's so much I'm embarrassed and even ashamed of, sort of. So much I want to run away from, so much I wish wasn't there, but I know is there. And somehow, despite all of that, you still choose to look upon me. He chose to look upon us. And He's not intimidated by our sin and by our brokenness. And so this morning, again, as we think of the cross of Jesus, your body, which was broken, we thank you, Jesus, that all of our sin is taken care of because your body was broken. Your body was broken so that ours didn't have to be, Jesus. You carried sin and you carried shame. And so even our shame we can cast off and our guilt we can cast off because your cross makes it possible. Jesus, you have seen and you continue to see. And I thank you, Jesus, that right now you see the cry of every one of our hearts, Lord. You see our desire to follow you, Lord our desire to know you, to be seen by you, to be loved by you, to see you and to love you. Maybe just before we take communion together, can I give you just where you're standing, just a moment, if there's something stirring in your heart, a prayer you want to pray, something that you want to bring before Jesus, whether in confession or repentance, whether just by way of supplication or invitation, whatever it is, Bring your heart, that which is stirring in your heart before Jesus. Thank you that you see our hearts and you hear our prayers this morning, Jesus. Right here as we're standing in this hall, you see me. I just saying some of us, we just need to just confess that out loud over our own lives, Jesus. You see me. Not the way the world sees us. Not looking down on me or judging me. You see me. You recognize me. Jesus is looking over our lives and he's saying, Saul Bonner, I see you. I see you. I see you. Jesus, thank you that you see us, Lord. Let's eat together. Lord Jesus, as much as your body was broken for us, your blood was shed. 
that there is not a single sin that can stand against the power of your blood, Lord. No matter how deep or how dark the sin appears to us, even if we are notorious and the worst of notorious sinners, Lord, you're not intimidated by it because your blood washes it. Your grace is stronger than our sin. Where grace, where sin abounds, grace abounds all the more. And I thank you, Jesus, this morning, that as much as you invited Zacchaeus, Lord, to step into His world, that right now you are stepping into our worlds, Lord. Not to condemn and to shun, but to heal, and to redeem, to wash our sin away. So Jesus, thank You for Your blood, which washes our sin away. Thank You, Jesus. Let's drink together. Thanks for listening to this message from Shofar Christian Church. We believe that you enjoyed your time with us, establishing God's kingdom and His glory in your life. For more info, call us on 012-362-1363. Email us, pretoria at shofaronline.org. Browse our website, www.shofaronline.org. Or like us on facebook.com forward slash shofarpretoria.org.